Hey everyone, welcome back to Factory Floor. I'm Jonathan Odom, and in this episode, we're talking electronics. Even with minimal knowledge, you can make smart decisions, keep your project on track, controlling costs, lead times, and making sure all the parts play nice together. I'll share a few lessons I learned the hard way and walk you through how we collaborate with electronics teams using Fusion, keeping mechanical and electrical design in sync. Let's get into it. Okay, so we're gonna go through these chronologically. So we'll start with the first one I did for the factory experience. I was super excited about this. I, I had just gotten this job and my manager came to me and said, hey, do you wanna take on this project? Uh, and they explained it to me and I was stoked. So I just jumped right in. Um, what I tried to do with this one was work with um, one of the companies that was in our residency program called SweetSense. What they do is make products that use uh, smart technology to help people in developing countries all over the world. And the guy I worked with from there had done an air quality sensor for uh, Rwanda, I believe it was. So the idea we came up with was to make a consumer product out of that same air quality sensor and then make it so that it was expandable. So if you look at the bottom of this, you can see these little ports down here. The idea is that we would have these connectors on there and people would be able to plug in, to use the data, to put it on a computer, uh, you know, track air quality where they are, maybe even have some kind of database where everybody could amalgamate data about air quality and stuff like that. So pretty ambitious, right? Um, the issue was that I'm not an, an electrical engineer at all, and neither was the guy I was working with on this. He's more of a mechanical engineer and was competent with uh, prototyping and stuff like that. But um, I learned a lot from this project, so let's just kind of dive into that. What it's doing is sampling air quality every 15 seconds or so. So I'll turn that off. Um, there's an indicator etched on the top that has a series of numbers. Those correspond to the LEDs, and it's basically just a dial where red means bad, blue means good, and it tells you what the air quality is. Um, it's blue right now because we're in this nice climate-controlled building. If I take this and kind of rub it on my shirt, depending on how clean my shirt is, uh, you're gonna see more red come up here. So what we've got here is about six, maybe 10. You can already start to see some of the design flaws here. You have to look at this dial on the top, correspond that to the glowing on the bottom. We basically just put this stuff together in a way that we could make it happen with the time constraints we had. We learned a lot about this over time and I'll explain some of that in version two. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this apart and we can get right into the electronics. And the way this works, when you start designing electronics for anything, is you start with a prototyping board. And I knew that more or less when I started this project, but what I didn't realize is that uh, you need to value engineer from that prototyping board and keep only the stuff you absolutely need because this gets expensive really quickly. The sensor itself, this is a Honeywell sensor, this black box right here, those are 20 bucks a pop. Uh, the battery, this is a LiPo battery. Both of those things are on this little carriage right here. The battery was, I think, six bucks, already up to 26 at that point. And then the PCB that we ended up making uh, was very expensive. Um, I don't remember exactly, but uh, it was way too much for a consumer product. And you can start to see why that is. If you know anything about electronics and you see this as a production board, you're probably shaking your head and, and making fun of me right now, which I completely expect and you're right to. Um, we've got the main board right here. So this is the PCB and you can see the shape of that original, um, the original prototyping board. It's got all those pins, the digital analog in and out pins. It's got the chip right there but there's all this other stuff added onto it um, to make the device work the way it needs to. There's a serial cable plugging this uh, sensor in, there's a battery cable plug in obviously, but there's a separate jumper uh, board right here that's on little connectors that had to be soldered on separately. There's another board over here connecting the main board to this, or two different parts of the main board, right? I think that's the ground. And then right here, this is the USB port, which is also for charging, but the USB doesn't actually program the board. So we had to have a, a separate programmer for that. And then there's a totally different board just for the LEDs. So insanely expensive, um, kind of just, just a silly design. And that's my fault because I didn't know what I was doing at the time. And I wasn't working with a, an electronics engineer until, I don't know, maybe a month before we put the, uh, the thing into production. So a lot of lessons learned here. 
Oh, I should turn this on. That might help. Help you see. You can, yeah, you can really see the holes there, right? Um, now, the idea with this, and the the original idea was that we would use prototyping boards so that it would be expandable. So that this is something that could have all those features we imagined, where people could hook it up to Wi-Fi and gather the data and put it together and all that stuff. So that's why there are so many features added on here. There's all these vias that are pins for analog and digital in and out. Um, there's There are serial ports. There's all kinds of stuff on this that costs money to add that we had to rethink later on to make this more economical to be able to do the project again. This product was really popular. Everybody wanted one. Um, we had lines, people were wait, waiting in line for hours at, at the um, at Autodesk University to get one. Um, so we had to kind of do a back by popular demand sort of thing. But luckily, I had learned a ton from doing it the wrong way first. So let's see the one that we improved on. The color is basically just another type of finish. This is a gold anodizing. Um, and we had a few different color options this time, which was kind of cool. And if you look at the bottom, you'll notice right away that there's a big difference between this design and the first one. So with the first one, you have all these different holes for the different ports, right? So the on off switch, the mode switch, uh, serial port, all that stuff is built into this injection molded chassis. But on this one, we simplified it and we just have a on off switch and a button for modes. And we added another feature here that you may be able to guess when I take this apart and show you the final PCB for this one. Same basic design. We didn't change the, uh, the chassis, um, I'm sorry, the, the, the housing here. Um, people really liked that. We kept the injection mold for this part. Um, sensors the same, batteries the same. But if you look at the PCB, a couple things show up. So the first one is the spacer here. So the old spacer was accommodated uh, a different design. The reason the spacer looks different is that this has a uh, Wi-Fi shield on it. So we added a new interface board and a Wi-Fi shield on there. We could have consolidated all of this stuff onto a single PCB, but with the time constraints we had, this was actually the, the least expensive way to put this together. So this is basically a backpack. You can pop this off and it's got these pin connectors uh, and they plug into the connectors on the board. And what this does is uh, sends out a Wi-Fi signal and tracks the air quality. The other thing we did that was an improvement here is that the LEDs are on the board. So we don't have to have a separate uh, Completely, we don't have to have a separate circuit board for that that's attached to it. It's all just on the same board. So for the third factory experience product, we wanted to do something new. And again, our brief here is something that is a consumer product that's handheld, has to be interesting to put together without being frustrating, um, needs to have electronics, needs to show different manufacturing methods that Fusion and our partners have to offer, and needs to be handheld. So the thing we came up with for that year was this uh, conference badge, a digital conference badge. Um, these are a fairly common thing. You see them at a lot of different conferences, conventions, that kind of thing. So the prototyping we did with this device, the, the original idea was that the device would stick together and you'd be able to send data back and forth, maybe play games, that kind of thing. So as we were working on this, we ended up going back to that original form factor um, from the uh, the prototyping board to the final. This actually seemed to be about the right size for what we needed this device to do. Before we could get a full prototype of the production board, we ordered these. So these boards have no traces on them. There's nothing here but the bare minimum for the components that are, that are going to infect the enclosure. So there's a battery connector, uh, there's a USB connector, these are all things that have some dimension that's gonna make a difference on the device and also things where the location matters. And critically with this one, we needed to make sure that these were going to mate properly in both dimensions and that we weren't gonna run into any problems with that. Where if the pitch was slightly different on some of these uh, vias, there was gonna be a big problem there. So we ordered these and did all our 3D printing prototypes with them and then that brought us to this final product right here. 
Now, this is a funny part of this story. Funny for you, I hope. For me, it, it, it put a little more gray in this beard, that's for sure. We didn't end up getting the code to run this product until two minutes before the expo hall opened. The reason for that is that when we designed this product, the only chip that was available was this one, which is the RP2040. If you know anything about electronics, you know what I'm talking about. It's a Raspberry Pi, it's ubiquitous, it's everywhere now. But at the time, there were no libraries for this. That means there was no code. You kind of had to start over from scratch. If you've ever coded uh, an Arduino, like a, some kind of prototyping board, you know that, that there are huge libraries out there. And if you're somebody like me who knows almost nothing about coding, you can still make stuff work because you can cut and paste other people's code, right? Well, the same goes if you're a really good programmer, if you're somebody who does this for a living. If there's no libraries out there, you have to make them yourself. So the guy we contracted for this was pulling his hair out trying to make it do just the most bare minimum basic thing. So uh, now the RP20 has tons of libraries and we don't have that problem at all. So when you see the new products, you'll see they, it wasn't that hard to, to program them. But something to think about, you know, the newest uh, chip may not be what you really need. It's kind of counterintuitive. It ended up working in the end, if only in demo mode. Um, there's still some of these floating around out there and they could potentially do all the things that we hoped they would. So. If you've got one and you're playing around with this, uh, throw your stuff up on GitHub, make a comment here. I know some of you promised you would play around with this and do some new library stuff with it. So I wanna, I wanna hear about it if you do. And then moving on from there, the next project we did was the keypad. So this is the shortcut keypad. It's a peripheral that gives you sh keyboard shortcuts and then an input device right here. So these are just normal keys. Um, if I were to click these, it would give me, um, you know, they're basically just keystrokes. The wheel switches between the most popular Autodesk apps. So this is a very easy thing to control. You can plug it into your computer, uh, bring it up in CircuitPython. Um, you can make this wheel do whatever you want. So the starting point for this, like everything else, is a prototyping board. So this is another one from Adafruit. This is a this is something they had off the shelf at the time. There was one major thing I wanted to do differently from this. The form factor itself, you really can't change much because you know, uh, like I said in the last episode, computer keys are kind of like a staircase. They have to be within a certain range, otherwise it feels weird and doesn't really work. Um, but the encoder on this one is vertical. So if I'm typing, right, I have to move and change my gesture to do this, as opposed to with our design, we put a horizontal one on there so you can do your, uh, you know, use the keypad and then move over here and you don't even have to change the position of your hand and then you can use the encoder that way. So this device didn't require much change from the original design because this original prototyping board has pretty much everything you need and not much else. When you're working with electronics and you're a mechanical designer like me, um, you need to be able to communicate with your electronics engineer in a way that's useful to you both. Um, the trickiest part of this design was getting this, this screen just right. So I get a cut sheet on this screen and it gives me detailed information down to the fraction of a millimeter on, for example, how long this ribbon cable is. So I can take this ribbon cable, I can design that in Fusion, make the, the 3D design of it. Not all this stuff is available in 3D. A lot of it you have to do yourself. Um, so I can do this no problem, right? It's out straight. But then I also need to be able to uh, measure it so that I know what the limits are gonna be when I snake it like this. I start to make an S curve in it. How far can I move this thing without putting stress on the uh, on the cable right starting to delaminate the way it connects to the screen these things can be pretty delicate so you have to be able to model this and then you also have to be able to model the component and put that all in a library so all that goes into a library that's connected to the the board design and I pop that in there do this and it's really important to get as close as you can to what you've got here and then in fusion you can make changes in the 3D PCB, and then those push back to the electronics engineer. I can't tell you how much of a difference it makes to be able to do this, where we have a 3D PCB in Fusion, and we can push 3D 
component changes back to the the board design and this which was all done in uh at the time all we had was eagle and we had to import export throw things over the wall um and then try to get it just right and hope that you're not missing something or nothing's off by a by a fraction or do you have the right version all that stuff i can't stress enough how seamless this is from the point of view of a mechanical designer so just to kind of sum it all up you're always starting with a prototyping board um, don't be afraid to play around with those there's a lot of work already done on them play around with libraries that kind of stuff that's not a hard thing to do as a mechanical designer. You can jump in and figure some stuff out. When you get into electronics design, if you're a mechanical designer, you're working with an electronics designer or an electronics engineer, what you need to do is keep communication open as much as possible. Always be talking about what's going on. Make sure there's a clear understanding of what the requirements of the product are and make sure you're always staying in touch about the bill of materials, the, uh, the components, what components are available, when you need to order things. Make sure you've got all that stuff figured out with your deadline in mind. These components, there are, there are hundreds of components on these things, and there's no telling what the lead times might be. And that's about it. Um, I would just close this up with some encouragement. This stuff is not as hard as it looks. There's a lot of talented people out there that can design a circuit board. If you've got an idea for a product, uh, don't be shy. Give it a try. Know that there are a lot of great resources out there to make this easier for you. So that's it for our electronics episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you feel encouraged, maybe a little less intimidated by this kind of stuff. I know I was when I first started playing around with it. Um, and stick with us next time. We're going to get into CNC machining, which is one of my favorite aspects of this project. And don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode.